Hey everybody, it's Ken. Just a quick question. Are you enjoying the podcast? Because if you are, can I ask you one favor? Just email the podcast to one friend who loves theater. If we all do that, we'll spread the words of these very, very smart people who've given their valuable time to come on the podcast for our own enjoyment and education. And it would mean a lot to them and a lot to me. So spread the word about the podcast with one email to one theater friend of your choice. And now on with this week's episode. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producer's Perspective Podcast. I'm Ken Davenport. I'm very excited to have an incredibly talented composer on the show today, one of the young guns of Broadway. Please welcome the Tony-nominated Mr. Matthew Squaw. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me. So Matt's the composer of the Broadway productions of The Wedding Singer as well as Elf the Musical. He's also the composer of two new musicals, Waiting in That Queue for a Broadway Theater, Halftime, mm-hmm. and The Prom, which has got a rave review out of town. So, Matt, tell me, what was your first encounter with the theater, your, your first date, if you will? Let's see. I was about five or six years old, and I grew up in New Jersey, and my parents took us to a matinee of Annie. And it was Sarah Jessica Parker as Annie, so I believe it was about 1980. And that was my first experience sitting in a Broadway house. And I just remember being mesmerized and just loving it. And then uh, we would come into the city every once in a while because we lived so close. Then a few years later, and I was probably around eight years old, my older sister did a local production, right? like in a summer program. And that's when I got to see the same show three times in a row, sitting with my family. And that's when I sort of just kind of was really enamored by the process and then seeing my sister up there and you know all the musicians playing here and I was just really blown away by it and then I kind of got the theater book and then I couldn't wait until I was old enough to be part of that so I had to wait three years but then I auditioned and then I started being a part of that that program which was really uh, an amazing experience and when did the love of music happen for you were you always a musician yeah I started playing the piano actually when I was two years old my dad is a dentist, but he worked his way through dental school by uh, playing wedding and bar mitzvah bands. <laughs> so uh, my parents actually met at a wedding. My mom was a guest. My dad was playing the accordion, I think. The accordion? Okay, dad. Whatever. So my dad would play the piano all the time. And I apparently loved when he would play the song Jingle Bell. And I would make him play it over and over and over again. And then apparently one day I sat down in a diaper and plunked out jingle bells on the keyboard with one finger. And everybody looked at each other and said, what the hell is that all about? And then they started me on lessons when I was four, and I did the kind of uh, traditional classical music training starting from the age of four. So were you one of, really one of those like musical prodigy kids? Did it come uh, just very easy to you? You know, I hated practicing so much, which is something I regret a bit, because I, I had a really good ear, but I didn't want to sit with the music because it was boring to me, so I wanted to make up my own stuff. So I would listen to recordings of what I'm supposed to be practicing in my lesson, and I would get by by my ear. So I didn't really learn to really uh, read and write music until when I was ninth or 10th grade, when I really wanted to look at this as a profession. I cheated a lot, <laughs> is what I'm saying. But uh, I loved you know, all different kinds of music. And then my love for the theater all kind of happened you know, in, in junior high. And then I started being in shows constantly. Started doing community theater when I was 11. Then I would have a school show in the spring and a summer show, which is, so I was doing three musicals a year, basically. As an actor. As an actor. But what was happening was that I was inundating myself with cast albums. So I was learning them and I, I was obsessed with them and I could play them in memory. I would go, you know, I remember I was in a production of Shenandoah and it was the first community theater production thing I did. And I just knew the song, so I would help play rehearsals. And I was really little. I was a little kid, but I could pick it up. So uh, it was, a uh, you know, I kind of realized early on that marrying music and theater is something that was very special for me, and that's something I, I just became pretty obsessed with. And you said that when you were in high school, you started to think about it as a profession. Mm-hmm. Did you say, I'm going to be a composer, that's what I'm going to do? Was that the profession you, you set out? Well, I, a couple of things happened when I was 14 and 15. And when I was 14 years old, my junior high music teacher asked me to write a song for the choir. And I'd never really written anything that was performed by anybody else. It was my first 
try doing that. So I wrote the song, we did it at the graduation, you know, the final concert, and everybody really liked it. And uh, with my bar mitzvah money, I had bought a four-track recorder that lived in the basement. And I made a demo of this song, kind of a pop version of the song, with just me, you know, playing piano with a little drum machine and, and me singing it. And I made this, it was in the days of cassettes. So I sent this cassette to the production company of the new Mickey Mouse Club that was on the Disney Channel because they had just started and every day they did a musical night. So I said, ah, why not? I'll just send it to them. And about a month later, they called and said, we love your song. We want to do the song on the show. We're going to fly you down. We want to interview you on the show. We want to give you a little award thing. So basically every Friday on the show, they would do a segment on two kids that were doing something a little out of the norm. So that that Friday, it was me and uh, Christy Yamaguchi, the, uh, <laughs> the ice skater. <laughs> so, is this on YouTube somewhere? The, the song is on YouTube. I put on my own Instagram uh, the very end, me looking into the camera and saying, see you real soon. He made me do that. It was the most horrifying thing. I was terrified. But what was amazing was going to that rehearsal and sitting on a professional soundstage and watching a bunch of professional people working on a song and staging a song that I made up in my head in, in my house when I was, you know, 14 years old. And that was the moment where I was like, okay, I want to do this. I want to do this. There's nothing like it. And then it aired. So that was going into 10th grade. So I was 14. And then when I was 15, only a few months later, I found out that Marvin Hamlet was doing a concert on my 15th birthday in the theater where I was in all those community theater shows. So I, I just wanted to meet him because I spent my entire childhood listening to Chorus Line and playing our song. And, you know, we have those, those uh, cast albums on rotation in the car. So I really just wanted to meet him and get an autograph, really. And what happened was the, the really nice lady who ran the theater was there to welcome Marvin. And he was just there by, with, with, with just himself and a drummer. And that's all there was. So he did his little sound check. And my job was to be an assistant to the ushers. So I was helping the ushers stuff programs. And uh, Martin finished his sound check, and then all of a sudden the door burst open to the lobby where I was. And uh, he said, where's Matthew? Where's Matthew? And I, and I just raised my hand, and he said, I hear you play the piano. I got a really nice one on stage. Why don't you go play? So I, I was not expecting this, <laughs> but I went on stage, and I played a song from their playing our song, which is one of my favorite favorite songs. And that went well. And then he, and then I played a song that I wrote, and I sang a song. I wrote, I don't know where, I don't know why I did it, but I just went for it. And then while I was doing that, he started improvising on top. Like he, we played four hands on this song that I had just written. And then he said, uh, Hey, can you play if you really knew me again, but can you do it in B flat instead of G? And I knew the song well enough to transpose it. So I, I transposed and he was sort of humming along to me. And he said, How old are you? And the lady from the theater was like, It's his birthday today. He's 15. And Marvin said, Do you want to be in the show tonight? I ended up being in the show with him after he finished. I believe my cue was Ice Castle. I was supposed to go in the past door backstage. And then he gave this introduction about how he met me. And he was hilarious because he was brilliant. He was a brilliant comedian. I came on stage. I accompanied him. He interviewed me on stage for a second. And we did the song. And then he, you know, and it was a really this kind of an incredible evening. And afterwards, we stayed in touch. And anytime he was in New Jersey, I always got to go back and visit him. He ended up writing me a college recommendation letter. He spoke to my parents at length about where I should go to college. And then when I was here, because he said, just go, he said, I think you should go to NYU if you want to be a composer. Because at that time I knew I wanted to be a composer, uh, certainly after the, the Disney experience. He said, uh, you know, you, should, you need to meet directors and writers. He said, if you go to conservatory, it's just going to be a lot of concert music. He's like, you'll be fine. <laughs> he said, you've got to make those relationships. And it was an incredible thing he did for me. And when I was living at the dorm, he was rehearsing something. And he said, hey, I'm at 890 Broadway. Why don't you come up and hang out? So I hung out with him for just a day just and just shadowed him. And uh, he was just really kind. And a lot of your early career was as a rehearsal pianist yeah. on a lot of shows, right? Yeah. Well, after I met Marvin, I just wanted to do whatever Marvin did. So I knew that he was a rehearsal pianist at 18. So I was like, I want to be a rehearsal pianist. I want to be, be a Broadway rehearsal pianist. And then also he went to Juilliard Pre-College. So the next year I auditioned for Juilliard Pre-College and went there 
for my junior and senior year of high school. So every Saturday, I would take a full day of courses. And what's amazing is that directly from Juilliard, I met somebody who had worked on Broadway a lot, and their former assistant was conducting Les Mis on Broadway and introduced me to the then music director of Broadway, uh, of Broadway Les Mis. And uh, I met this guy, and all of a sudden, I was subbing on Broadway as a keyboardist uh, my freshman year of, of college. So I was living at Hayden Hall down at NYU. What a dumb play. Oh, oh, hello. My God. I can smell, I can smell the weed now. Am I allowed to say that? It was, uh, but it was, a, it was an amazing experience. And I, I got to do that mostly because I was living in New York and I was available. I mean, every, every Broadway musician is looking for good sub. And especially if they're young and available and they can do it, you're gold. <laughs> So after I played my first performance of Les Mis, they needed subs at Miss Saigon. And there was a lot of the same music department. So then all of a sudden I was sent over there. So I spent many years as a rehearsal pianist and then ultimately a conductor at both of those shows. And it was really a great learning. And I remember the first time I heard your name was with the show called the Rhythm Club, uh-huh. right? Yeah. That was where I, like, I feel like you burst out onto the yeah. scene as this demo started to make its way around all these offices. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that, how that came to be. Well, I, I met uh, my writing partner, Chad Beglin, when I was 19. So this was about 20, almost 24 years ago we met. And we had written two shows that had readings. And one, and our second, uh, our first show had like a reading. And we didn't have the rights to it. We learned that, that lesson really fast. <laughs> and then the second, it? It, it was E.M. Forrester's Morris. Chad always wanted to do that. But what we didn't know is that it was the only novel that Ian Forster wrote that was not in the public domain. <laughs> and we just didn't know. But we wrote it, and it was a great learning experience, and we got to see it. And then we wrote another show. We went the other direction and did an adaptation of Oedipus, which is this wacky Oedipus thing in a, in a film noir. And we, but we had this great cast. We, we did it with Lynette Perry and, and Jan Maxwell and Mary Von Davis and, all these incredible people were in this production. That was our second show. That's and amazing. That, but by the way, I have to say that when I was 16 years old, I wrote a letter to Andrew Lloyd Webber saying, you should write a musical about Oedipus. I love it. I love it. Send me yours. Listen, we'll talk about it You later. got it. You got it. It's on the way. That that show had a jazz score, and Chad and I realized uh, that we really liked working in that uh, language. So Chad had come across this story, and, and it was, it was real, not a story, but it was a, a historical event of these kids in Hamburg, Germany in 1938 who were obsessed with American swing music and it was it was illegal in Germany you get arrested on the street for singing and just getting past it literally and these kids were risking their lives to pretend they were American and sing these songs and we thought wow what an interesting idea for a musical there was a movie that came out and it, but it, it's based on the same phenomenon but it was our we wrote this our own story for it so we started that, I'm going to say, in 1997, 96 or 97. And uh, we wrote four songs, and we submitted it to the ASCAP Musical Theater Workshop that is run by Stephen Schwartz and uh, Michael Kirker. We sent that show, and we sent the Oedipus show, which was then now called Wicked City, to the workshop to be considered. And Michael Kirker called and said, congratulations, we made the uh, workshop. And we were thrilled, but we thought it was for the other show. <laughs> And then I finally, at the end of the phone call, I said, uh, so which show is it for? Because we submitted two. We said, oh, it's for, uh, and then it was called Swing Alley. We, we kind of uh, lost all the blood in our faces because we realized we'd only written four songs. And for this workshop, we had to perform 45 minutes of the show continuously. So we got in, and we just had to write really quickly. And it was a great lesson in just having to deliver quickly. So it was, I think we had about four or five weeks to do it. And we had this great cast, and I had been work. I was then working at Titanic as the associate music director. So I just called in a lot of favors to people to see who could be in our cast. And we had this great cast. It was like we had like Alice Ripley and Clark Thorell, and and all this amazing cast came on. And that show got us sort of on the map. And Billy Rosenfield used to run RCA Victor was in the audience of that. And so were Beth Williams, who at the time you know we were working as fellow pit musicians. Beth has gone on to be this big Broadway producer, but I was a keyboard two player. She was the keyboard one player for a while in Les Mis. So that's how I knew her. And then her husband, Alan Williams, were there and they optioned the show from us. And then we started really digging into it and doing readings and 
we came really close to coming to Broadway, but we have the heartbreak of it not happening. Yeah, and before we get to the heartbreak yeah, yeah, yeah. of it all. Oh, yeah. I just love, I mean, mm-hmm. it sounds like, obviously, your background of being a pit musician and all these connections that you had really helped you get these shows noticed because of the cast, because of all oh, yeah. these people. Yeah, I, I think being being in the pit of a show, especially if you're conducting a show, is the best seat on the house to see how a show is constructed. It's right in front of you. And you're kind of the heartbeat of the show. Um, but also you can see how, how the set is, is, uh, is moving, how, what needs to be accomplished in order for this piece of a set to be off, for this thing to come on, what music is needed to do that, do I need a safety van, do I need, you know, all these things on how shows are constructed, being, you know, in a rehearsal cast or a pit musician or a conductor is a great way to learn those things. What I love about your story is that you wanted to be a composer, but you knew that there was a stepping stone to be that. So many people I know probably yeah. like, I want to be a composer. All the yeah. people are right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, I, it took me 12, 12 years. I, I spent 12 years in the pit, and then it took another two. I had to leave it, like really leave it, and then I finally was able to get a show here. So it was a 14-year process. So your first show gets off and we're probably comes mm-hmm. very, very close. Yeah. doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. What do you do when you... Get so close to it. Well, I learned a lot of lessons. It was heartbreaking. I'm not going to lie. There was a picture of Chad and me with our billboard in, in Schubert Alley. We were up. We, 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 oh, we, we, we looked like the happiest little kids you've ever seen in your life. It was, we had a theater. It was all announced and money just fell through. And then all of a sudden, just like dominoes, it just, it, each piece of it went down. Our, our out of town got canceled and then they tried to sell it and it just, it just wasn't going to happen. You know, it was really devastating, to say the least. But I worked with Maury Yeston a bunch at, at during Titanic. I, I was with him the whole way. I was the rehearsal cast for the workshop and saw the, sh- the show through, through Broadway for like the first year and a half. And he's, been, he's always been a, a really good mentor. And I was obviously shaken up by everything. And he said to me, he's like, look, it happens to everybody. I'm sorry that this happened your first time. He said, but... I think the lesson to be learned here is that I think you can't have just one show going on at once. You know, you can't have all your eggs in one basket because if that thing doesn't happen, you're going to feel how you feel right now again because it's going to happen again. It happens to all of us. It's happened to the best of us. And it was an important lesson to learn. I have to limit it. I can't take on seven things. My brain can handle. I try to have two or three going at the same time. So if one stalls, I can focus on the other one, but I think it was a really important lesson to learn early on. And ever since then, I've tried to multitask a bit. Did you think about giving up? I'm going to say for about a year. I lived on 57th and 8th at the time, and I had to go back. The, the very kind people at the Saigon, you know, I believe they even threw me like a little congratulations goodbye party that you're out of the pit, you're a composer now. And, uh, and then it happened. I was like, um, you need any, uh, you need any uh, keyboard one subs? Uh, <laughs> So I, I went back to work, but it was really difficult for me to come into Times Square and Schubert Alley because that poster was up there for a few months. And I would literally walk by it just, I couldn't believe it was happening. I was so excited and I was so, so innocent back then. <laughs> and then, you know, it was hard to go walk into this neighborhood for a while. But then, and because, directly because of Little Club, you can really draw a straight line for, for, for all these projects. At the first reading of Rhythm Club, Alan Williams pulled me aside and said, Margot Lyon wants to talk to you and Chad. And uh, we said, okay, and we knew who she was from, from Jelly's Last Jam, and, and this was probably 1980, uh, sorry, 1998. She just said, I just want to let you guys know that I think you're incredibly talented, and I would love to work with you on something someday. Here's my card, and let's stay in touch. So we were blown away by that, and uh, stayed in touch with her, and we would talk to her every once in a while if we had an idea, we would meet for lunch like once or twice a year, and then she had this huge move of hairspray. And at that time, we were still hoping that Rhythm Club might be able to find its way back to Broadway. And then once it was clear that it probably it wasn't going to happen, Margot called us up, and now she had this big hit. And she said, I want to work with you guys, and let's find something. And at the same time, and this is sheer coincidence, Chad was pitching a screenplay to an executive at New Line Cinema named Mark Kaufman. And uh, they were talking about a screenplay. And then all of a sudden, Mark kept saying, Chad, I know your name, and I don't know why. I don't know why. 
And then they realized the demo of Rhythm Club was sitting on his desk. And he listened to it, and he really liked it. And Billy Rosenfield said to Mark, you should listen to these guys. So we had the Margot connection. She had produced Hairspray with Mark and Michael Wayne at New Line. We had this big, big success, and we basically said, what can we work on together? And that's how The Wedding Singer came up. And because it was a project that Chad and I thought was inherently musical. We both grew up in the 80s. That music, you know, it was the, you know, the, besides cast albums, I also happened to listen, you know, I knew my 80s music as well. And we also just loved the, loved the story and had a great heart to it. So we had, you know, having virtually no credits, we had to work for it and we had to write songs on spec. Yeah, there was an audition process. Yeah, there was an audition process. And the first thing that had to happen was that the guy who wrote the movie, a guy named um, Tim Hurley, who had written a lot of stuff with Adam Sandler, the head writer of Saturday Night Live, he was very interested in being involved in it and he had to sign off on it. So we just had a meeting in the New Line conference room and within five seconds we knew, we knew that we were going to be friends. We just hit it off and, uh, we, Chad and I wrote, I think, three or four songs and submitted them to Tim and to Margo and to Michael Lee and Mark Kaplan. And about six months later, they said, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. And that was our, that was our kind of thrust into that whole world. So how did it feel when you actually got opening night on that one? Oh, it was, it was thrilling. It, it was, um, that show was a labor of love for a lot of us. And for us, it was our Broadway debut, but also, you know, we got to work with great artists like John Rando and Rob Ashford and, and Scott Pask and, and Brian McDevitt. Who, and, and I got to work with David Chase for the first time, who's uh, a genius. And, and a lot of my friends were in the past, which I was not anticipating. It had nothing to do with me. They earned the job, but it was just a wonderful experience. And, and, and also, we had to learn how to write under pressure. Because we did a, a, a tryout in Seattle, and the reviews were mixed. And we had about three weeks to come back and turn things around. And we really rewrote Act One of that show in a really big way in those three weeks. And uh, I'm really proud of the work that we did on, on that show. It really came a long way. And then, and then we opened, and it was a little touch and go at first. But then the Tonys came around. And we got five Tony nominations, and and then all of a sudden we got a nice bump from our Tony performance, which which went really beautifully. And that was that was the that was the highlight for for me. Just you know, getting nominated was incredible. But sitting in that and at Radio City and and seeing all your friends up there, some song you wrote, pretty cool. But tell me about your process. Are you guys, are you music first? Nerds? Tell me about how you guys write. Um, we, we do a lot of talking first about the whole show. We try to have an outline of the whole evening first. We, we did that on Wedding Singer and we did that on Elf and we've done it on Air. We certainly did that on Prime. We try to pick the moments that we think we'll sing and having the whole outline before we write everything, for me at least, makes, uh, makes it easy for me to have a musical shape. So. You don't have three ballads in a row, so you kind of can figure out what the tempos of each song uh, of each song is, so it even has has a good shape to it. What makes a moment sing in a musical? Like, what are those moments? Well, they I, look like? I mean, I think you know it is that moment where speaking won't get across the emotion anymore. You just get to the point where the emotion gets so high that you just have to break out into song or or into into dance. And I think you just have to feel what those moments are. I always think. Musicals can be, there's nothing like a great musical. There's also nothing like a musical that's not done well because you feel the breaks get, you know, when the music starts and the breaks feel like they just got turned on, that's like my life's goal to avoid. You know, always trying to make each song continue the story, you know, develop the plot going, or develop character. You just have to make sure the story continues and they're just not stopping to sing a pretty song. So that's when I think the show is being offered. But uh, so we work really hard to make sure that the momentum is continuing to, to push through. And is there, what's the big difference between adapting something like The Wedding Singer or Elf mm-hmm. or your first show, or not your mm-hmm. first show, but Rhythm Club was yeah. an original yeah, idea. Yeah. Is it, do you find it more challenging to adapt when there's a foundation or less challenging because there is that foundation? Well, I think when you're adapting something, there is always, there is always that, that framework. There's always, you can always go back to the original source material and say, all right, what did they do here? Why did they do it? How can we, how can we make this our own? But it's still always there. When you're doing something from scratch, there are no limitations. So that in, in many ways, I think it makes it more difficult, but 
will ultimately become a bit more rewarding when there are characters that you completely made up in your head that have never existed before and people are in the audience are being really by them. So I think it's probably more challenging to do something that's that's totally original, but adapting something ain't so easy either. <laughs> So Wedding Singer happened, mm -hmm. Elf happened, mm -hmm. yeah. two big shows on yeah. Broadway, they're being done, Wedding Singer especially I'm sure is done all over the world. Yeah, we've had over, over, I think we've had over a thousand productions. We're actually going next week to the Lester Curve because they're starting a big, really uh, extensive tour of Wedding Singer. So Chad, Tim and I are getting on a plane on, on Saturday to go to, to check it out. We're excited. That's amazing. Um, so mm -hmm. you, you get these shows up, you get them out there, and now, mm -hmm. so that's it, right? Life, life's easy, you get lots of other opportunities <laughs> coming your way, you're a big Broadway composer now. If only it worked that way. You know, it look, it's great to have shows here. I think the goal is to continue to be able to work on that level. And in many ways, you always have to start over a bit. And I don't think it, it gets a little easier because people at least and go on iTunes and listen to your work so they at least know that you've been here before. And especially if your show has made money somewhere, they'll, they'll listen. But, uh, getting a show on Broadway, it's, it's very challenging, even for, you know, people who are far more experienced than you. Do you find yourself still mm -hmm. having to promote yourself or market? Like, what do you, what do you do? How sure. Much? I mean, I think, I think it's pro, I, I should probably be more aggressive about it. Some people are really fantastic with it. I, you know, I'm getting more active on social media and I, I finally have my own website so I can be in charge of what people see. I do think it's important to get yourself out there. I have a great agent who also, you know, represents a lot of great writers and I'm very happy to be in that camp and I've met a lot of wonderful producers and I get pitched ideas often. But my, my thing is right now is I know the show's going to take five to seven years before it really gets anywhere, if it gets anywhere. So I really want to be sure that it's something I'm just so excited about that I'm jumping out on the stage, get up in the morning and work on it every day. And I think that's not easy to find. So I, the two shows I'm working on right now, I, I feel that way about. I, I'm waiting. I have a couple of things that might happen, but I'm not sure yet. But I think it's, you're always having to start over after a show's open. But I think that's sort of what's exciting about it. But it, it, it certainly is a, you know, getting to Broadway is, fantastic. Staying on Broadway is what the goal is. And you've worked with a number of different types of producers in, yeah. in your career. Mm -hmm. What makes a great producer to you? I think somebody who provides you with the resources that you need to do the work that you need to do, whether it's giving you a studio for a couple of weeks to just work, maybe semi-stage something, do a 29-hour 20, reading. I also think it's really helpful when you have contractual deadline because so you have to do it by a certain date i just think it and any structure is good and when you're in the middle of the creative process i think it's helpful when producers can you know say look at this area this area doesn't feel right some people think you know and and uh i haven't really worked with producers who've done this but i know people who have that will tell you you should you need, you need to this is what you need to do this is how you fix it and i find that i'm not sure if that is as helpful and also, I, I think notes should really come through one person. I've been involved in shows where there are lots of producers, so you've got lots of people in your ear, and they don't always have the same opinion. So and you want to serve serve them all, and you want them to be happy, but you also want to have a focused focus note so you know how to address it. So I called you one of the young guns of Broadway, one of the rising superstars. Mm -hmm. you got a couple shows out there already. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I'm sure there'll be many more to come. But in, in your peer group of all mm -hmm. the other guys and girls that are out there doing, yeah. doing your thing, are you guys all friends? Is there a, Honestly, like a budding networking group? Like, do you hang out with them? Yeah. I have spent a lot of time at events with Tom Kitt, Nell Benjamin, who I'm, I'm writing halftime with, Larry O'Keefe, who's her husband. I see Bobby and Kristen all the time. You know, we all, we all have the same agent. So we, we're all kind of in, in uh, Team Bazzetti. So we, we all have become friendly through this kind of network of people and, and, and Lynn Manuel. And you know, it's like this amazing group of people. And we have all become friendly. And it's really fun. And then you get to, you know, I'm so happy for them when they have these great successes and they're good people. And everybody, everybody, you know, in this gang, everybody's in it for the right reasons. And, and uh, they just love what they do. And it's, sometimes it's humbling to be in that company. 
you talked a little bit about getting pitched ideas. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer to have ideas come to you or for you to come up with your own? I mean, do you Google for, like, I need a musical idea? We, I, we've all got it. A chat and I have spent so many hours in bookstores just saying, what can we do? What can we do? And, uh, but either way is fine for me. As long as the idea sparks and it feels like it can be, it, it feels meaningful. It feels like there's a reason for these characters to sing. Then, then, then I'm on board for chat. I don't care who you do. Is there something specific besides the can it sing? Is there a type of story that works? Or actually, a better question is, can anything be a musical? I think it's all in the execution. I mean, everybody you know points to Billy Todd. Who the heck ever would have thought that would work? But it's one of the greatest musicals ever written. My personal opinion, and I think my taste is just to go for the fish out of water story. A main character who doesn't quite fit in and finds themselves and changes every and changes everybody around them in the process of the show. That's usually what I'm attracted to. That's certainly what, what Buddy Who Else is. That's certainly, in a way, what Robbie Hart is in Wedding Singer. And that is definitely what the characters are in our upcoming shows. I, I like writing about the outcast and having them try it somehow. I'm just scrolling through my mind and thinking about how many classic musicals follow that model. So mm -hmm. that's some great advice there. Okay, my last question, which is my genie question. Mm -hmm. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to see you and knock on your door and mm -hmm. wants to thank you for all your contributions to the musical theater world so far and grant you one wish. Mm -hmm. What's the one thing that makes you so angry that pisses you off, <laughs> that really has you flipping tables, throwing your baton, whatever, you know, smashing your keyboard down, that you'd ask this genie to wish away in his I wish we could double the amount of theater we had in the city. <laughs> Says the I'm man not, with two shows exactly. just waiting. I know. I'm, you know, I'm sure it's not, uh, that's not the most original answer I'm sure you've gotten, but, but it is true. It's, it, it's crazy. I've never seen it like this. It's really, uh, there's a jam and there are great shows that, you know, have to wait and there are great shows that, you know, hopefully don't be able to be seen, but there's a serious, uh, real estate jam and it's great for the business. But uh, I wish there were there were a few more empty ones to allow some new shows. I mean, because we're having these shows now that run for five, ten years. There's so uh, little turnover that it's hard, especially for a moderate sized musical, to get to get uh, a shot. So it's yeah, a tough so, one. Certainly, I've I've got one of those moderate sized musicals myself. Yeah. That's waiting in line. Yeah. But you're such a great example of that because when you got started, you were an unknown. No credit. Yeah. And you had a theater for the Rhythm Club. Yeah. And well, yes. And now, yeah. You've got Broadway credits, Tony nomination, yeah. a rave review out of town. Yeah. And you've got two shows. Yeah. I'm still, I mean, you just have to wait and see what, see where everything lies. And it's when I have to, you know, just meditate and, and think about what's next because I can't control it. <laughs> yeah, so what, I mean, I can't control yeah. it either. <laughs> me so what do you do besides meditate? Do you do another project? Do you... Yeah, I'm actively looking for an, another project. I like to kind of write smaller little things, you know, a song cycle here. I, I always do the, well, not always, but in the last, I think, five or six years, I've done the uh, uh, opening number for Bravo Bears, which is always fun. It's kind of like this huge 50-person, eight-minute Events that, that, uh, and working with Jerry and Nick Hank was always great. So I try to do smaller projects and I dabbled a little bit in, uh, TV and film, which I like. And I also like that once you're hired, you know what's actually happening and you know that there's a date where it has to be done and then that's it and you kiss it goodbye. I try, I, yes, I am actively looking for, for what's next and I'm considering a couple of things right now. And it's getting to be that time where hopefully one or both of these shows and I think announce, hopefully announcements will be happening soon. But, uh, and we'll be able to move on. I'll be able to move on to whatever the next is. The next thing is to start from scratch. My fingers are crossed for you. Thank you so thank much you, for doing this. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks to all of you for listening. Tune in next time. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then. Bye. Don't forget, if you're enjoying the podcast, do me a favor. Email it to one friend, at least one friend that loves the theater, and let's spread the word about the theater all over the world. Thanks. I'm gonna be a producer.